As a part of this worship service, we will have a time to reflect and participate in the sacrament that our Lord Jesus has given to his people. Please have ready some bread and some wine or grape juice for this time to reflect and to remember. Hello and welcome to worship. Um, hopefully you are uh, mindful that uh, we have begun going to one service on Sunday morning. Um, perhaps you are watching this because you forgot about it, but please don't forget about it next weekend. Uh, we'll continue through the, this through the month of July and most likely throughout the month of August is our plans. So uh, yes, one service and hopefully all is well with you. Um, a couple other announcements that I do want to share with you is that this upcoming weekend of uh, July 2nd and 3rd, um, the 4th, which is a very special day for many, uh, our Independence Day, uh, we, the office will be closed. And so please make note of that as well. Um, on the 3rd again, we will have one worship service. And on the 2nd, we have one worship service that is at 5. The one on Sunday is at 9 a.m. Um, and so um, also uh, just a reminder that on the 5th Tuesday, that the 5th Tuesday, Tuesday the 5th, uh, we begin a book discussion. The book discussion is um, on uh, the, the book The Cost of Discipleship by Dietrich Bonhoeffer and um, some of the subjects that we'll be covering on Tuesday, the first day of the first three chapters of the book. Uh, we'll be looking at, uh, again, um, uh, cheap grace versus costly grace. Um, uh, cheap grace that of being um, a grace of humankind as opposed to the costly grace of Christ uh, we see in God. Uh, in Christ Jesus, and so uh, we, we'll discuss those a little bit. We'll also discuss discipleship, but also uh, obedience to God's Word, um, uh, uh, obedience in the mind, um, having a mindset of Christ um, as well. That's a lot to discuss in, in one hour, um, but uh, that's that's what we're going to try to accomplish. It's going to be fun. It's going to be um, So please, please uh, join us on Zoom at 10 a.m. or live uh, here in person uh, in the fellowship hall. Um, and then uh, finally, just a reminder that in a few weeks we will be having our Vacation Bible School, which is in the evening. Uh, and so if you're able to help out with that in any way, uh, please let us know in the office um, and just give us a contact call, 520-883-0627, uh, um, and that will be greatly appreciated. And so with that, um, this being the 26th, this is the, um, again, the third Sunday after Epiphany or <laughs> Epiphany, boy, the third Sunday after Pentecost. Uh, we pray that your week goes well, and may the Lord continue to bless you and keep you. Um, have a very blessed week. We continue to live our lives in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires are known, and from whom no secrets are hid, Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I ask that we observe a moment of silence for reflection and self-examination. Most merciful God, we confess that we are held captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for us and for his sake forgives us all of our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to us the entire forgiveness of all of our sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
I ask that we now join together in praying the prayer for this third Sunday after Pentecost. Together we pray, O oh God, you have prepared for those who love you joys beyond understanding. Pour into our hearts such love for you, that loving you above all things, we may obtain your promises, which exceed all that we can desire. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. First reading for this third Sunday in the Pentecost season. It comes to us from the book of 1 Kings, chapter 19, verses 15 to 16 and 19 to 21. This is right after God appears to Elijah in the form of that mighty wind after Elijah just wants to take a break. And, and God basically comes to Elijah and says, you know what? Guess your ministry is not done. Here's what you need to do. And God gave him this list. Then the Lord said to Elijah, Go, return your way to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive, you shall anoint Hazel as king over Aram, and you shall anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, as king over Israel. And you shall anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, at Adel Melah, as prophet in your place. So Elijah set out from there, and found Elisha, son of Shaphat, who was plowing. 
There were 12 yoke of oxen ahead of him, and he was with the 12. Elijah passed by him and threw his mantle over him. Elisha left the, left the oxen, ran after Elijah, and said, Let me kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow you. Then Elijah said to him, Go back again, for what have I done to you? He returned from following him, took the yoke of oxen, and slaughtered them. Using the equipment from the oxen, he boiled their flesh and gave it to the people and the ate. Then he set out and followed Elijah and became his servant. Here ends our first reading. We turn now to the Gospel of Luke, the ninth chapter, verses 51 to 62. And Luke has put a, a lot of follow me passages, and I think he does that intentionally so that we can hear the various responses to what Jesus tells and tells people who want to follow him. Hear the words. When the days grew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem, and he sent messengers ahead of him. On their way, they entered a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him, but they did not receive him, because his face was set toward Jerusalem. When his disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But Jesus turned and rebuked them. Then they went on to another village. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes of holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, Follow me. But he said, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, No one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. This is the gospel of our Lord. Welcome to the children's sermon. I like children's sermons. They're those things that we actually try to think about our own childhood. And, and to me, you kids, and the kids that are hearing here, uh, the voice and the adults, and it doesn't matter, we all know what it is to follow. We knew how to follow before we even knew what the word meant, right? We absolutely did. As a kid, you look at the little babies, and you know they are following you. Even that stupid thing about putting their finger uh, in front of their eyes and watching their eyes go back and their head and go. Even from an early, since we were very, when we were born, we followed. We just did. We, we follow by example. We look around and we and try to see where we fit in in the world. And, and it's one of those things that even in, then we go to school and what do we have to do? We have to follow in line. We have to follow instructions. We have to do all of these things so that we can, number one, continue to grow, so we can continue to learn, so that we can continue to have adventures, so that we can continue to take and trust those that are in front of us and around us and get by in this world. Following is incredibly important. We become part of a community when we follow. You kids, you know that you've been taught to follow instructions. You have been taught to stand in line. You've been taught to this is what you do, and you follow. Well, Jesus is trying to get people to follow him. What a novel concept. People who, some of them had heard him. Some of them didn't know who he was. But he invited them and said, come follow me. And that takes a lot of guts to follow Jesus, to follow someone who you don't know for sure. And so today we get a chance to take and realize that promise that we do follow Jesus. We follow him in such a way that we don't even necessarily realize how much we have been influenced by those before us who have followed him and followed his teachings and followed his way and followed his message of love, care, and grace that we give. Today, you kids, <laughs> yes, you kids, as stubborn and independent as we are, 
you follow our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In his name, amen. Have you ever gotten some really exciting news? Maybe your grandma, who you haven't seen in a long time, is coming for a visit. Or your favourite sports team won the grand finals. Or maybe your parents are taking you to Dreamworld for the first time. Did you want to tell everyone that good news? Were you so excited that you wanted to tell even people you didn't know? Paul had some pretty exciting news too. It was the good news. He wanted to tell the whole world that we are sinners and separated from God. But Jesus died for our sins and now we can be right with God. At the time Colossians was written, Paul was actually in prison for telling people about Jesus. That's why he started writing letters to different groups of people. He didn't let being in prison stop him from discipling other Christians. He trusted and fully believed in Jesus and wanted everyone to follow Jesus. Paul encouraged the Colossians that even though he wasn't there in person, they were still connected through Christ. Paul also encourages the Colossians that it's not only knowing the good news and sharing it with their words, but also with their actions. It's about putting what they learn into practice by living a life that pleases Jesus. This applies to us too. God wants us to tell and show everyone about Jesus, those we know and those we don't know. So, who are you going to tell today? Let us pray. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of each heart who sees this image, who hears my voice, I ask that you continue to fill their minds with the spirit that allows us to continue to know the promise that is you. In your name we pray. Amen. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and our Savior, Jesus, who is the Christ, the risen Son of God. Amen. <laughs> um, one of the great things about this time of year, guess what? We hit Pentecost, didn't we? This is that wonderful season that many of you know that just seems to go on forever. Uh, it's one of those where it's like 25, 26, 27 weeks, depending on the church year, of Pentecost. Well, that whole season of the year uh, is, is that idea of what it is to be a disciple. This is the time and this is the season where we get the miracles. This is the season where we get, um, we get his teachings. This is the season where we actually kind of get the guts of what Jesus was trying to tell us. And so it's, it's amazing then, and not, not unpredictable, that one of our first lessons in the season of Pentecost is to about following, about what it is to follow Jesus. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> to follow him. Well, well, it sounds so easy. It sounds so easy to follow Jesus. I mean, could we imagine our lives without it? But now we're going to go back, and I'm going to try something a little bit different. So, how spontaneous, how, how free are you? I was going to say spontaneous, spontaneous, but I can't get that word out. Are you a spontaneous person? Are you one that, that you can just simply take off and go? I still smile one of my favorite commercials, one of my favorite Visa commercials. They hit it right on as far as my personality. The family was going to go, uh, the couple, they were going to go to a winter retreat. They were literally packed for all of those things. And suddenly then, here they get to the airport and they see a tropical Caribbean travel poster. And yes, you guessed it. They used their visa card and literally changed, got new airline tickets, went into the gift shops and bought brand new clothes because of course they had no planning to go to a Caribbean. They were going up the hill to ski, and lo and behold, they've got the happy couple running hand in hand on the beach. A spontaneous vacation. <laughs> I know, we don't 
necessarily do that. That idea of suddenly changing our minds, suddenly going and, and taking a different path. So, how spontaneous are you? How spontaneous are you? Well, I better make sure that I'm a pastor here so that you actually hear these words as I put in my collar. Because, of course, if I do this whole thing, you will say, oh, no, that really wasn't the pastor. He didn't have his collar in. But how spontaneous are you? And if you can answer that question, then you can understand a little bit more about our first lesson in our gospel. It's simple. Elijah has been told to call Elisha. That's what he is. He's been told to call him. So what does he do? Does he simply have a long discussion of trying to convince Elisha to follow him? No. <laughs> I still laugh that we've got this. Elijah basically takes his uh, walks past Elisha. Elisha's plowing in the field. So out in the middle of the, of the field, here Elijah takes off his mantle, his little rope thing. Pastor Dan and I, if you want to do it this way, it's kind of like our stole that we wear for the robes. And he, when we wear robes, and he basically walked by, put that on him, and kept walking. Huh? Elisha has no, no say in the matter. He doesn't even get a chance to respond. He basically says, what? Huh? He's plowing. And suddenly, this Elijah puts on this sign of office on him and keeps going. What would you do? Elijah goes, wait a minute, what happened here? Stops the, stops the plow and all that stuff, stops the line and says, Elijah, what are you doing? What are you, uh, well, follow me. Oh, uh, um, 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 okay, tell you what, that's fine. Um, but I've got some things to clear up. Um, can I at least go tell my mom and dad? <laughs> and Elijah basically says, okay, if that's what you're thinking of and not following, you know, Abraham, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, just go home. I'll take my mantle back and I'll find somebody else. And Elijah says, no, no. And so what does he do? <laughs> he basically then butchers and sacrifices all the animals that were being used to pull the plow, gives it to the people that were hungry, and follows Elijah. Now, there are many things about that nice little scene that, that draw us to it. One is that Elisha basically can't go back. He can't go back to his job. He can't go back to plowing the field. He literally cuts that, cuts that promise to do that. I still smile as an aside note. Do you think his dad's happy that he basically took and, and got rid of the implements that were going to be used to create food? But one of the things that it really shows us uh, that Elisha knew and embraced that promise that promise that allowed him to see beyond and to see that privilege that he was being given to walk in the path and in the shadow of the great prophet Elijah. It, and so we know that Elisha grew to be a great prophet. He was the one that took over for Elijah to be that mouthpiece, that be that spokesperson for God that gave the People that hope and promise and that connection that so many needed. But Elisha had to take that step to follow, to trust, and to know. Now we're fast forwarding, and, and I am going to take a look at this because it's so much fun. Luke has compressed, and these probably didn't happen on the same road. You know, but, but for Luke, he wanted to make sure that you got the sense of, of what people's reaction would be to, about following. But we want to, first of all, know that they say what it is that Jesus is bringing them into. Our reading today, it starts off by Jesus is going to go into a Samaritan city. 
and the city doesn't welcome you. And James and John immediately want to take and bring down fire and brimstone and wipe out this city. And Jesus just smiles and says, we'll just keep on going. How close they came to hearing the promise of God. And so we get, the, we get the people that want to follow him and the people that Jesus asked to follow. The guy came running up to him and said, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus wants him to be really clear about what he's asking. This is not, he could see perhaps the glitter and the glitz of what it is to be a disciple of following Jesus. People would come from all over to listen to what Jesus would say. And so I'm sure he was thinking, oh good, I get to follow him. Just like in our world today, we think about the stars and the musicians and the artists that we know that are on the radio. And we go, oh, we think about their entourage, staying in the best hotels, eating the finest food. We want to be part of that. And Jesus basically says, there's real work. If you listen to anybody of, that they've told the stories of being part of a crew, of putting together shows, it's late nights, early mornings, and fast food. One of the things that Jesus wants to say is that basically there will be no settling down. You never know where you're going to be sleeping. You never know where you will be eating. You'd never know what God will provide for us. And we don't know what he says. He went to another person and said, Jesus said to him, follow me. But he said, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Oh my gosh. And Jesus says, okay, I guess let the dead bury their own dead. But as for you, come and proclaim the kingdom of God. How much does it take to take and serve and follow Jesus? If someone were to suddenly say to you and, and hear that, okay, I want you to take and, and go here and follow me, and the funeral's the next day, and the person says, no, you can't go to the funeral, follow me. We would think that would be so insensitive. So insensitive. But what Jesus is trying to get through is that the person who has died is already in the arms of God and you can do nothing with them and for them. Except now, to make that journey and make that walk. To help others to know the hope that comes. The last person. I will follow you, Lord. But let me, first of all, say goodbye to those of my home. It's one of those things of saying, I will, in our day and world, in our world, it would be that, okay, God, I'm going to follow you, but first of all, let me get my affairs in order. Let me make sure that my checklist of all the things that I need to do in order for to follow you will go ahead and get done. If you, if you want to think about that in other terms, think about going on vacation or for the winter visitors that come and go. Okay? Think about all the things that you have to prepare for your absence, number one, as well as your trip ahead. You have to make sure that all the bills will get paid. You'll have to make sure that your house is being taken care of. In the case of Suzanne and I, we got to make sure that that cat gets fed during the time that we're away. All of those little nitpicky things as a and it continually be that prepare yourself to leave, even when you're coming back. Imagine then what Jesus is asking these people to do. I'm saying, you know, let me go back and say, tell them that I'm going so that they don't worry. Because isn't that care for your relatives? Care for your family. So they don't think they just dropped off the earth. I come back and say, how spontaneous are you? 
It has to be such a, a draw of Jesus and a command of Jesus to follow me that you really do lose all sense of self. When God comes and says through Elijah, through Jesus, follow me, it's like everything else begins to take second place and is behind because here is this connection between you and God and Jesus and you. And you get the chance to hear that word of follow regardless about what all those things would have to prepare. I think about the young children who basically, if you say, okay, let's go, let's follow me, they don't even hesitate. They get up and away they go. Okay? One of the fun things is as you, live, as you watch the children's sermons while the kids are in, excuse me, in the sanctuary, of course it's that deal of, okay, come on down, and they just follow the instructions and come and sit in their place right here next to the altar rail. It's like, okay, here we go. And then when they're done, when you say, okay, now do this, and away they go. That whole business is about following. Because isn't that what Jesus does? And isn't that what Jesus says? But sometimes it's not as clear cut. Follow me. Really? Are you sure? That's what we have today. Is we are preparing our hearts and our minds as we make it through this season of Pentecost to put one step in front of another as we, as Jesus reveals what it is for us to follow. Today, we don't have to do grandiose things. We just simply have to have that mind of Jesus, that heart of Jesus, that I, knowing that he is the one that leads, guides, encourages us to continue to stay in that promise of his love, care, and the grace and hope that we have. Sometimes it's easy to follow. But sometimes it's a little bit more challenging when the, when the leader up in front is a little murky and you can't quite see clearly. And that's what Jesus comes to us, does. And he kind of clears our vision and says, Here, here I am. Come, follow. Today, that's the invitation. Come, follow. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth continue to give you that promise that, Lord, we truly are your children. Help us, Lord, when, when our, our wandering seems to be lost and we forget that little bit of an understanding that it is you that we follow. Give us that which we need in that moment in that day. In your name. Let us now join our hearts and our minds and our souls in a word of prayer to our Lord and our Savior. Let us pray. Gracious and almighty Lord, you call us. You call us to follow you. The call comes at different times in our lives and at different moments. But in truth, Almighty Lord, you call us to serve you each and every day. We pray, Almighty Lord, that you continue to stir up your Holy Spirit within us so that we have the ears to hear your voice in truth and the eyes to see and acknowledge and recognize your truth and the hands and the voice and the feet to share in that good news and truth of Christ our Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty Lord, we do gather today around your word, and your word is truth. And we pray, Almighty Lord, that we make no other home in this world other than the home that you have prepared for us. In other words, Lord, may we live our lives rooted in faith and in your word knowing, Almighty Lord, that it is these eternal gifts that will carry us through this life and into the next. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious and Almighty Lord, it's not easy to be a disciple in our world today. 
I don't think it's ever been easy to be a disciple in you, in your presence, in your risen promise, in your risen presence among us. And we ask, Almighty Lord, that as we continue to grow in faith, may we shape the world around us and not have the world shape us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty Lord, uh, there are many who are ill in mind, body, soul, and spirit. And we pray, Almighty Lord, that you bring health to them, bring healing, bring peace, bring a sense of well-being, bring a sense of your spirit and your care into the hearts and souls of those who need healing, Almighty Lord. And we pray for all who are instruments of healing in this world to do their best to bring healing. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty Lord, all these things, we, we have heavy hearts and light hearts, joyous hearts and sorrowful hearts. But no matter what, we place our hope and our words and our dreams and our cares in your hands, knowing that, Almighty Lord, you receive them and you act in gracious and incredible ways. Through Christ Jesus, our Lord, in whose name we give thanks and praise. Amen. It is in the night in which our Lord Jesus was betrayed that he took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in the remembrance of me. We now partake in the bread of life. Again, after the supper, he took the cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant of my blood shed for you, for all people. For the forgiveness of sin, do this in the remembrance of me. We now partake in the blood of Christ. The blood of the body and blood of Christ are given and shed for you. And now may this body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ continue to strengthen us and keep us in his grace, now and forever. Amen. Let us continue our prayer together. As we pray the Lord's Prayer, let us pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you in favor and give you God's peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. There is a name I love to hear.
Let us go now in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.